screen. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yes. Looks good. Can I, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, yeah, glad uh, glad to be here with all of you. I, I regret we're not in Paris now, but uh, still very interesting conference. So uh, I will talk today about uh, yeah, evolution of cancer and metast metastasis and the evidence of immune selection that are uh, imposed on tumors during uh, during evolution. So my talk will be like much more da data oriented and um, um, like so I'll show uh, inference uh, from uh, from data. So uh, this is done in collaboration with. Uh, uh, many people uh, from New York and, and Princeton, uh, prominently with Vinod Balachandran, uh, Ben Greenbaum, and more, more recently with uh, Zach uh, Setna. Uh, just to, uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so, uh, so evolution uh, uh, of cancer, so tumors are uh, evolving populations of cancer cells, like we also heard uh, before. Uh, so here's an example of an evolving um, tumor to the right. So it starts with some uh, accumulation of mutations in normal, uh, in normal tissue. Uh, there were some driver mutations, maybe uh, alterations or like single point mutations or genome, uh, uh, like larger genome rearrangement may happen. And uh, the, so uh, at which point uh, uh, the cells become uh, malignant, like the tumor cells. There's some first uh, parental clone uh, that starts growing faster. And uh, in the course of the tumor growth, uh, uh, the, the, there can be subsequent mutations uh, uh, originating. So it's, uh, so tumor is, uh, is gaining diversity and um, it's first growing within the tissue where it originated. And then uh, at some point you can um, seed uh, metastatic uh, tumors in some other in some other uh, uh, tissues in some other places in in the host so uh, yeah so we are as I said in the beginning we were interesting uh, in like looking on cancer data and seeing if there's any evidence of uh, immune selection that is uh, that is acting on this uh, the shape this evolutionary process and uh, that's what I'm going to tell you about. So I will tell you first about how we can quantify immunogenicity that is uh, as a fitness cost that is imposed on those, on those cancer clones. And then I'll show you how we can trace uh, this uh, immune selection during uh, the evolution of metastasis in pancreatic cancer. So, uh, so how uh, tumor cells can be seen, uh, uh, recognized and seen by the immune system, this uh, like one of the main mechanisms is via a presentation of nantigens, which, which are mutated peptides. Uh, so which are uh, peptides, proteins that contain a mutation that, uh, that gets to be presented by MHC, uh, class one mechanism on the surface of the cancer cells, which are then subsequently, may, which may subsequently be recognized by uh, T, -cell, uh, T cells of, uh, of, uh, of the patient. Uh, of course, uh, not all uh, peptides are going to be uh, uh, mutated. Peptides are usually just contain one single point mutation, so they are not all of them are going to be distant enough from the um, normal cells, uh, normal uh, proteins of of the host. So this it's a it's a big question: which ones of them are going to be are are can be really uh, can really elicit immune response and be seen by uh, by, uh, by be recognized by T cell receptors. So uh, when we started this project with uh, Ben Greenbaum in uh, 2015, I, uh, I think this is uh, we the evidence and like what we saw uh, in in data was uh, like in other publications was was that. Uh, uh, under immunotherapies, the patients who were responding better to therapies were those that had many mutations, um, which is sort of um, agree, like which, which uh, intuitively means that those patients just have many may have many more uh, presented antigens, and, and therefore there's more ways for the immune system to recognize the, their tumors. On the other hand, there's also the evolutionary aspect of it that this heterogeneous tumors uh, are um, 
so the tumor heterogeneity actually has a negative impact on uh, the, the success of therapy. And that's because not all antigens are present in all parts of the tumor. So you may uh, eliminate parts of the, by therapy, parts of the, of the tumor, uh, but it's, uh, it can be only the peripheral ones while the trunk of the, like this, the, the trunk uh, of, the, of the tumor will still, will, will still, be, uh, still be around. So we wanted to uh, uh, sort of phrase this, like just combine all this, uh, all this uh, observations into one model. And that's how we, uh, sorry, just, this is how we uh, propose our non-antigen fitness model for tumors. So I just briefly uh, go over this. Um, so first we wanted to qualify uh, probability that a given antigen will elicit immune response. And for that, we took two, um, well, phenotype or like two properties into account, the likelihood of uh, MHC presentation and the TCR recognition of antigens. Um, so we wanted to infer both of this, uh, both of this uh, properties from a uh, uh, sequence of the, of the peptides. Um, so, uh, and, uh, so yeah, so just uh, and so we did that. So MHC presentation is uh, can actually be predicted with existing uh, net uh, ex existing tools like machine learning by based tools like NetMHC, uh, which uh, which uh, for a given peptide and the HLA, HLA type of the patient can return a, a binding energy. So this we um, sorry a dissociation constant which we can tra translate into likelihood. Well, for TCR recognition, we uh, also proposed the like, a bit heuristic uh, approach to where we were comparing those uh, those sequences of this uh, of this uh, peptides to known uh, microbial epitopes for which uh, for which we knew there is uh, that have been uh, that they have been uh, recognized. Uh, so, so just like from uh, uh, taking this from uh, from database of of confirmed uh, uh, peptides epitopes. So um, yeah, so this uh, using that we were uh, uh, we could propose this function that has uh, this immunogenicity cost for a given antigens, which is just the uh, the product of this two uh, of this two uh, uh, probabilities uh, uh, more or less. Then um, uh, then uh, so the second part is that one uh, cancer cell. Have, can have multiple antigens, uh, and then by fitting this uh, model to the data, uh, we uh, we came up with the with definition for uh, fitness cost for the cell that is just the maximum fitness. Uh, this is just the maximum cost over all antigens. So yeah. So the question here was. Is it are all of these antigens being recognized by uh, by the immune system, or just or one of them? And according to the just by feeding the, to the data, uh, and it it turned out that it's uh, that this all usually effect of one uh, one of these antigens that is dominating, which is also with um, what it's uh, uh, believed to be uh, like, which is which is called immunodominance. All right, so uh, now. Um, since this was like one part of the uh, of the complexity, uh, the second one that is like more close to the topic of this workshop is the heterogeneity uh, of the of the tumor. So tumor cells are genetically heterogeneous; uh, they potentially can have uh, different immune interactions. Um, so, uh, uh, but when we we can uh, look at it in this. Uh, uh, we can look at it, of course, as, as a tree, as a population uh, uh, of uh, tumor is a population of cancer cells. And if you are able to reconstruct this uh, population, then our task uh, becomes a bit uh, easier. So we can, uh, uh, so we can, yeah, we know how the uh, different, so we know like how different clones, uh, which mutations the different clones have. If we know how they more like how they nested one in another, uh, then we have our fitness model that can that I can associate fitness cause due to each of the clones, and uh, using some like projection, we can predict uh, or like forecast into into some time into the future how each of these individual clones will uh, change uh, change in size, and uh, and then 
how the whole tumor will respond to uh, to this uh, uh, immune recognition by uh, immune recognition. So yeah, so that's what we uh, so that's what we uh, compute. So like I, I just. Uh, talk in a bit how how this how we arrive at this tree. But if we have uh, sizes of different clones in the beginning, we have the fitness of uh, of clones due to immune selection computed by our model. Then we uh, then uh, yeah we can project it into uh, into the future, and then uh, and then we get this value called n of tau, where tau is some characteristic time at which we evaluate those predictions, and this is also a parameter uh, of of the model. Yeah, so just like to uh, to talk a bit uh, uh, shortly about phylo uh, this uh, clonal structure reconstruction, uh, this is uh, a, a work from uh, Quad Morris lab. Uh, so we use an algorithm uh, called phylo WGS that uh, uh, tries to reconstruct these clonal structures from uh, bulk sequencing data. This is not 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 at all an easy problem because you can imagine that the only data that we have here are uh, mutations and the number of reads at which they were seen in a, in a given sample. So it's really like one dimensional data if you have one sample. And then uh, there's a very many clonal structures that can actually uh, uh, agree with the distribution of these frequencies that, uh, uh, that are seen in the data. Uh, so the algorithm is clustering these tumor mutations by, the, by their frequency reads and then tries, uh, finds the most likely, or like the family of, uh, of the likely trees uh, that don't deviate uh, the constraints imposed by, by this frequency data so that uh, smaller clusters are not, smaller clusters of mutations don't form clones that uh, contain larger uh, the, uh, uh, groups of mutations that have higher frequency. So this reconstruction becomes easier when we have multiple samples is because the resolution and the clustering of, of mutations uh, is, uh, can be better. And, uh, but it also allows for a drawn tree, uh, a, like reconstru a reconstruction of a drawn tree topology of, of multiple samples. All right, so uh, just to come back to the first result, so we, uh, uh, to validate this, uh, this model, we were computing this N of tau value, which is the predicted size of the cancer population under, under therapy. Uh, and we could rank patients by, their, uh, by, this, by this value. And then uh, on, uh, on data sets, we were seeing that, uh, uh, that, multi that these patients, that we were properly uh, or like significantly separating long and short-term survivals uh, in uh, melanoma and lung. So, uh, so the next application was in, uh, uh, in uh, pancreatic cancer. So this here we had access to a very interesting data set uh, where if patients were not under immunotherapy, but uh, uh, were many, where half of the patients were actually very long-term survivors of, uh, and they lived more than uh, five years, which is not, uh, which is very atypical for pancreatic cancer. Uh, where 7% of patients survive um, only five years after diagnosis. So this was quite a unique cohort for testing this, and this model as well. And uh, here as well, we were seeing, uh, when we just applied this to, the, to this data, we were also able to separate uh, long and short-term survivors based on the uh, type of non-antigens uh, that uh, they had in their tumors. And uh, um, Remarkably, like a typical model that was uh, used, that which just counts the number of antigens or, or mutations, is not able to separate those uh, long-term survivors for short-term survivors. So this uh, brought us now to uh, looking on, on this data set more or better. And um, um, so, uh, so we also have access to metastatic samples from those uh, patients. Um, and uh, from short and the long-term survivors. So uh, again, so we have five uh, short-term survivors and uh, 10 long-term survivors. So, and again, uh, the assumption here is what, the, what is the belief about this data set, uh, about these patients, is that the long-term survivors have more uh, active immune systems. And that's why 
um, and that's uh, yeah, that's hence the hence their uh, uh, prolonged survival, and that's actually what was the uh, what was also the conclusion from our previous analysis on on this uh, on, uh, on 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 this data set. So. Uh, yeah, so we have this paired uh, primary metastatic uh, tumor samples. Uh, Short-term survivors usually have more than one tumor, uh, metastatic tumors. Uh, so, it, uh, uh, so there's um, um, quite a lot of paired data uh, that we can uh, look at. And uh, yeah, so this is, so the questions that like when we, uh, the questions were here was, what can we tell about uh, evolution and the, and especially when we contrast uh, this, those long-term survivors that have more active uh, immune system and short-term survivors. So, and uh, are there any patterns of uh, immune selection? So first, uh, as I, I was uh, saying before, so we reconstruct uh, the phylogenies of, of those tumors. So here we always have at least two samples. Uh, so we have the primary tumor and the metastatic tumor. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is uh, so this is an example uh, of such reconstruction. As you see, it's quite coarse, right? So we usually have those. There's usually like uh, only several clones. Um, that's how this tumor would look like in the in the primary tumor. It's colored by the predicted fitness cost. And then uh, we can see how the same uh, the same tree and the, uh, how we, how the same clones look in the metastatic tumor. So as you see, can see that this is the clonal structure is the same. However, there may be some clones that disappear or appear between the time points in the metastatic. So this is an example here, and the clonal composition. So the sizes here of of those clones may may differ. So that's. Again, an example. I just like to come back. So here's the nest, the major, the first clone um, that originates from uh, from the normal uh, normal tissue, and uh, and the nested clones. Uh, this this clone has high uh, high fitness cost, and like, according to the like, predictions, is in is uh, decreasing in size. However, there's another clone, the C4, that uh, took over this larger and that has a new subclone. Uh, that, uh, that grow in the metastatic tumor. So it's like another view, you can look on the frequencies of these individual clones uh, and, and uh, see how, the, how they change uh, between the time points. So here's a new clone, so it had zero frequency, it grew to five, uh, it grew in the metastatic and, and, uh, and so on, while some clones are decreasing in size like clone, uh, like clone three, for instance. All right, so uh, so like looking on this data, we can uh, um, like the one of the first uh, things that uh, that becomes apparent is that short term that the tumors of short term survivors are much more heterogeneous than the tumors uh, the, of uh, long term survivors. Um, they have many less clones, which is also would be in uh, agreement with. Uh, the signature of like would be like some signature of higher negative selection in the tumors where new clones, if they appear, uh, they they can be just uh, wiped out if they are uh, uh, immunogenic. And this is some quantification of this. So if you look both on primary and uh, and uh, and metastatic tumors in short term survivors and long term survivors, and uh, we uh, quantify heterogeneity as uh, uh, well, here we show uh, each of the entropy, so some effective number of clones. We see that this number is significantly uh, smaller in, in long-term survivors. Uh, so another thing that we, uh, that we uh, proposed was to just, uh, it was a, a test on selection, a simple test on selection, uh, where we uh, compute uh, the number of presented, the fraction of mutations in the tumors that are uh, presentable uh, by MHC. So there are, would be predicted by uh, computational methods to have the potential to be presented uh, as antigens in the tumor. Uh, and then we compare this, uh, this number again in between these two cohorts, short and long-term survivors. Uh, and then again, we see that this fraction is like around 27% uh, in short-term survivors, but it's like this, like, uh, 
uh, but it's uh, decreased uh, decreased in in long term survivors again uh, uh, proving like showing some evidence uh, that there is uh, that there is negative selection on on uh, this type of mutations and that uh, of the type of mutations that uh, uh, that create uh, uh, presentable uh, antigens. Um, and then uh, yet another yet another property uh, we can uh, we can like now just uh, look go back to our model uh, this antigen fitness model and like once we have reconstructed this clonal structure and we have the clone sizes we can compute what is the average fitness of uh, of uh, like over clones or like what is the fit average fitness of this uh, tumor as a population of cancer cells. And then, uh, so when we then like just uh, uh, call it this to be the fitness cost of the whole population, uh, we see that uh, short-term survivors can have higher fitness costs due to this immune recognition than long-term survivors. And then it's again, uh, what it means is that the long-term survivors simply like cannot, uh, that this is really the right environment um, uh, for the uh, long-term survivors to evaluate fitness of the tumors, while short-term survivors who don't have active immune system, for them, they don't really, uh, those tumors are not really seen by the, by the immune system, so this model is just not the, uh, not the right, uh, uh, well, uh, not the right description of, of the fitness of those tumors. So there may be some other effects uh, that are, uh, that describe this, uh, uh, the fitness of those tumors better. And this is even more apparent when we look uh, on the clones that are really new to the uh, metastatic uh, tumors. Uh, so in long-term survivors, really the new clones that are appear in those, in those uh, uh, the, the new clones that appear, uh, barely none of them really has, uh, has a potential uh, to be recognized by the, by the immune system. So they really find a way to evolve and uh, and not uh, not to be uh, not to be uh, recognized by, by by the immune system. Um, yeah, and then the last thing, so I'm just going to be wrapping up, is that this sort of uh, um, that this result or this observation uh, it shows that the this long-term survivors and like the tumors that are actually evolving under immune pressure, they actually find a way to evade the immune system. However, the short-term survivors, they still has a room, uh, there would still be a room uh, for, uh, uh, for turning, for like making those tumors uh, visible. So the current or like pancreatic cancer is not typically or has not been typically uh, treated with, uh, with immunotherapies, uh, but uh, according to, like, to what we see is that there would be uh, some way uh, that if, the, if those tumors were uh, exposed to immuno, immunotherapy, then uh, um, and the, the, the immune system and the, 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 there would be peptides that could uh, uh, be recognized and uh, and um, um, and uh, yeah, and they could have it could be effective in those tumors. So here, like we show the predicted again in metastatic cancer, we predict this n of tau value. So this is how how we, how effective we think a therapy could be. Uh, so the right, the more uh, the the more uh, decrease in size, the better the effect of therapy. So there's not so much room in in the long term survivors anymore, but the short term survivors uh, could be more uh, could be more better could have better uh, if, uh, reaction. Okay, so that's uh, all I had uh, to say. Yes, I was showing this uh, uh, antigen fitness model. Uh, where we define the fitness cost uh, of uh, cancer clones, and uh, yeah, I showed how this um, um, I showed that the evolution of metastasis uh, uh, is consistent with the immune selection scenario in in patients who are believed to have uh, active immune system. Okay, thank you. So yeah, I'm happy to uh, take questions. Thank you, Marta. Um, please, everybody, feel free to put questions in the chat. Um, I will start with the question that I had. I was wondering, 
I'm, I'm far from this field. So, you know, uh, <laughs> um, my question is somewhat of an outsider, but I was wondering, like, if you could, um, what, if you had one wish for experimental data, what uh, would be the uh, key to, you know, advance the field beyond what is currently possible? Like, would it be better to have things that are go deeper or more uh, time points? And like, what, what would be the most advantageous? So I think, yeah, so in terms of, uh, yeah, I think that, yeah, there would be two things, I think. So like one is better, better phylogeny reconstruction. So this is, uh, like better resolution on, on, on this uh, uh, on this uh, side. So I think like you know single cell uh, single cell data where we really like, we don't have to guess which mutations are coming together in a clone, but we just uh, have it given. And another thing is probably just like better uh, guess on um, uh, on uh, well immune recognition, right? So which which antigens, which peptides are really the ones that elicit immune response. So, um, but this is of course, like, also, it's not only data, but it's also, um, yeah, it's uh, either better models for that, for predicting, uh, for predicting, uh, um, yeah, so, so I'm talking about no scenario where we also have the TCR, uh, TCR data from uh, the patient and, uh, and have peptide and we know the mutations in the, in the tumor and, um, um, yeah, so, and then we know which of them really are the ones that were the elicited response. I see. Okay, thank you. Uh, Benny? Um, uh, yeah. Great talk, uh, Marta. Uh, very nice work. Uh, I may have missed this, but I, I, I wasn't quite clear. How do you balance in the fitness measure um, the different um, contributes to uh, whether the tumor is antigenic? I mean, for example, if um, a particular allele is actually not expressed, which often happens, I guess, of MHC, mm -hmm. then however many antigens you have predicted, they won't, they won't be presented. I, I just wondered what sort of hierarchy you have in that thing, or processing well, similarly would be. Yeah, so, yeah, so this is, uh, yeah, well, that, uh, that part, I think it can be always like corrected with, uh, with data. So now, uh, so what do we do? Yeah, maybe I'll go here. So what we did here is, was that we were uh, just like find, computationally uh, finding all PEP or nantigens in a clone. And uh, so each of them could be associated with a different HLA type. Um, we try, no, we actually, um, so yeah, so this could be corrected also by like checking expression of the of the HLA genes and seeing like whether they are expressed or not. Um, and sometimes there's also loss of heterozygosity, right? So there's only like uh, yeah. this less. So this is of course could be could be corrected, but it, it, again, it like uh, um, we at the time also when we were doing this, we were not like very uh, content with the quality of the bioinformatic tools for for, for estimating this uh, the expression uh, or like we don't know, we didn't always have it. Do so, you have RNA seq data for that, for those? Uh, sometimes, sometimes. So like on this, on the data that I was showing you, we don't. Uh, yeah, right. we don't have it for the for this pancreatic cancer or nor the, the other day on the right. cohort that we had. But it could, of course, it could be always just improved and made, made more, um, let's say, realistic. <laughs> right, so maybe. Yeah. Great. Uh, there's a question. Uh, maybe we have time for yeah one more question. So. Um, Question from Aditya, uh, does immune selection promote or encourage diversification of neoantigens within a single patient? In other words, are neoantigens more diverse within a single person than between people? Hope this question makes sense. Um, I this, I don't, okay, so one, for one thing, this is like when we talk about nantigens, uh, they usually are, Sort of like passenger mutations, so they don't happen. Uh, so like you don't, you you rarely see the same um, mutations that are immunogenic between uh, between patients. So this is like not not commonly seen. So like, 
um, like we have some like other work on that, but uh, uh, but uh, but usually like say this driver genes uh, that, that that are have mutations shared by many patients that are not uh, they don't carry many like they don't they are not immunogenic. Um, so this may be as so in this sense like I don't see like much of difference between how uh, between. Uh, so there's not much sharing between uh, 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 between uh, patients, uh, between people, and um, within a single person. That yeah, that's again uh, those those mutations can happen uh, randomly, right? So like uh, at the random positions in uh, in uh, in the genome of of, of the cancer cell, and um, and they can be as diverse. Uh, as uh, yeah, as between people. Thanks. Yes. Thank you, Marta. Um, thank you for a great talk. Thank you. And we are now moving to our concluding speaker.